Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Brooks Holtam, who is a professor of management at Georgetown University. His research focuses on how organizations acquire, develop, and retain human and social capital. He received the Human Resource Management Scholarly Achievement Award, and he has performed research in or several uh, as a consultant to many organizations. Welcome, Brooks. Oh, thank you. I'm very pleased to be with you, Gil. So I want to start with um, with your book, uh, which is uh, which was, um, I guess, published in 2013. Uh, disrupt or be disrupted, a blueprint for change in management education. And uh, as you know, there is a lot going on <laughs> in both structure and content uh, of education today uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, but in the, in the book, you say in the past 25 years, dramatic marketplace transformation, technological advances and globalization have led to completely new ways of interacting, sharing, learning, and doing. Um, and, and that challenged the, the very core of graduate management education. So responding to today's challenges while balancing relevance, value, and reputation, you say will require business school administrators to engage in unprecedented amounts of strategic thinking, creativity, stakeholder engagement, and interpersonal effectiveness. Now, I would, I would think, Brooks, from 2013 to 2020, uh, there is a lot more data around uh, these types of things. A lot of things have changed. So do you want to talk a bit about what uh, you were sort of laying out in the book and how things might have changed over time? Absolutely. I was grateful to collaborate with Eric Deerdorf as a co-editor on this volume that was sponsored by the um, Graduate Management Admissions Council. And the purpose of the book was really to help administrators think about how do they shape the portfolio of business school offerings into the future. And I don't want to be too self-congratulatory, but as you've suggested, seven years later in 2020, many of these trends now are playing out. So you see, for example, the explosion in specialty master's degrees not only in the number of degrees offered, but the number of people pursuing those degrees. Yes. So whereas 20 years ago, it was really, you know, you want MBA? Well, do you want it during the daytime or do you want it during the nighttime? That was really sort of the options that you had. But now there's a version for people who are straight out of undergrad. Many schools call it a master's in management. Hmm. They might, might have been undergrads who were, studying foreign uh, relations or political science or Spanish, and they decide they want to pivot to business, but they don't want to wait five years to go back and get the MBA. So they get, you know, really a one year intensive experience. And we see that market blooming across, you know, the U S and across other countries. Uh, 
you've got a, many other specialty masters like masters in HR or accounting or finance um, that have come out in the last uh, five uh, years or so. But what we're seeing right now is, is the continued innovation there in things like sustainability, hmm. right? And healthcare informatics, right? So we're getting especially sort of focused and narrow and it's it's fascinating to watch. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't know a lot about this, Brooks, and you are in a very unique position uh, with responsibilities, both in administration as well as in teaching. Uh, and so when I think about specialty management degrees, you know, uh, sometimes and there uh, used to be a bit of a criticism around that, and that is the more specialized you get, uh, the, the more of a deep dive that you take, the less broad your, you know, sort of uh, understanding is going to be. For example, you know, how a firm functions, how a firm creates value, you know, those types of things. And so, so I all, always felt there is a trade-off between, you know, kind of deep dive and going, going broad, right? There is. So if you take probably the fastest growing area in business schools, which is around business analytics. Mm -hmm. right? So you've got degrees that span sort of 12 to 24 months, many of them online, most of them hybrid, some of them in person. So you've got a lot of flavors of this, but these programs will have more or less of what I might call core business disciplines integrated into them. Okay. Pro programs that are more on the 12 to 14 to 16 month um, range and maybe 30 to 40 credits often have very little accounting or finance or marketing involved in them, whereas the two year programs will have relatively more. So there is some variation within these types of degrees, but this is a very popular degree. And you're right that even though it comes from business school, sort of the broad business background is relatively limited. Okay, so th those types of courses then, Brooks, business analytics, for example, could be given by an engineering school or computer science uh, department uh, if the content is that specialized, right? Uh, many, many schools, uh, mathematics, statistics, computer science are offering uh, programs. The, sort of minor differentiator is, you know, business schools call it business analytics, but the other schools will call it computational analytics or some other sort of variation on that theme. Okay. Um, but the, you know, what, what business schools I think hope to add there is a, some foundation in core business and then application of the tools within business. Um, but it's, um, a market where if you are a, a student thinking about a program, you want to think very carefully, where do I want to end up and what do I want to be doing? Hmm. Do, I, do I want to be running the queries? Do I want to be structuring the you know, supervised learning and AI? If so, maybe I want to be in a computer science program or department. But if what I want is to to excel as a marketer. I might've been a marketer as an undergrad, but I want to now do marketing analytics. That's where I think you, you'd probably prefer the business degree, right? Yes. So yeah, go where, ahead. I, I, if a student approached me and said, professor, I'm thinking about looking at, at a specialty masters. My first question would be, you know, where do you want to be when you come out? Right. Right. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. So um, just like you said before, uh, from Georgetown's perspective, you're looking at this as a, as a portfolio of products. Uh, some of them are uh, very specialized and you do have the, the more traditional uh, management degree as well. So the question for students, it appears to me, is exactly what you're asking. So what exactly do you want to do? And that answer has to determine what what courses or not courses what program they want to get into and this is a this is increasingly a bigger problem i would imagine for large companies because you know if if they hire just i shouldn't say just but the typical mba types uh, only into into the management program 
they may not have the skills needed to to stitch uh information together to to uh you know you know into the decision layers of the company right so you you raise a really interesting point and i think for me it points to the importance of continuing your education so i happened to be on a call yesterday with a partner in one of the large consulting firms talking about certifications and badges hmm. and so they bring in a large number of new employees every year some are undergraduates some are mbas but he said there's a tremendous appetite for continued learning in that context and they want to find ways to satisfy that to develop their people and so you know uh, a certificate course on artificial intelligence or robotic process automation or or things like that cybersecurity those types of topics i think are going to be even more important in the future so if 70 years ago in our book we were talking about the rise of specialty masters if i were writing the book today i'd be talking a lot more about sort of modular education things that are stackable could you take 10 certificates and make that into a degree because hmm. i think that we're uh called upon to learn at a faster pace than than ever before yeah so it's all, almost like those modules are skills and so if you can provide a uh, sort of customizability flexibility that each student could actually create a program that best best fit with that student's requirements right yep yep so it becomes very specialized and that's um you know in sync with what we think the market's demanding what 22 and 27 year olds uh want yeah and continuous education in this context it's different now so continuous education used to mean um you know when when i was in the corporate setting in the 90s it's really taking the high performers and sending them to an exec program uh for a couple of months and the focus there is you know sort of leadership skills and things like that uh but in the current context uh it's it's a very different product right i mean th- those products might still exist but i think more relevant products now are things that have uh more content in it more specialized content in it certainly they meet the urgent demands interestingly the demand for our executive mba and our executive masters of leadership programs has remained steady hmm. and so i find um some comfort in that because these are people who are investing in maybe what i would call the longer perspective or the longer view on yeah. what they aspire to in terms of leading organizations and and we certainly need that but there is an immediacy that um is satisfied with the masters of business analytics or masters of hr or other more technical degrees yeah so how have things changed brooks from 2013 to 2020 um you know if you look at that portfolio of products that you're offering today uh, from 2013 how have they changed well the most significant is one that was hard to envision in 2013 and that's really the political environment in the US and the antagonism towards China i don't know if your listeners are aware that 25% of the tuition paying students in australia come from china and so with severe limitations right now on immigration between australia and china their universities are at extreme um risk right now with major cutbacks in faculty and staffing because they don't have the students that they had planned to have when they were building infrastructure and building staff and faculty. Mm. That's the case for the US too. It it is and indeed just 6 weeks ago, you know, the um department of homeland security had said that if a significant portion of a foreign students classes are not in person we are not going to give them visas we're not going to allow them to enter into the country and so schools like ours were absolutely scrambling to try to put together plans whereby their students could be partly online but also partly in person and that's part of what put a lot of the pressure on schools to open up 
Yeah, and there was a lawsuit against that, right? Did, did that uh, change after that or no? So when the lawsuit was um, announced, there were some negotiations that took place. I can't comment on those negotiations. Okay. Yeah. But what I will say is many schools were a party to that lawsuit. And um, we are grateful that the um, administration backed off of those requirements. And yeah. that has enabled us to enroll students from China this year. And while in the U.S. it's not the 25% that it is in Australia, it is a significant number of students. And importantly, they pay um, tuition, right? So these students tend to be um, high tuition paying students. Yeah. So do you think this will have sort of a systemic structural change? Uh, for example, if I'm China or India now, uh, this might open up an opportunity for me to start, uh, you know, products, uh, maybe more branded products in, in education, uh, especially in management. And I can go out there and perhaps, uh, perhaps acquire, um, you know, top, uh, uh, top researchers and, and, um, and teachers and then, and then start to create products that is inside the country. Do you, so do you think uh, this will lead to some sort of systemic structural change over time? Uh, it certainly presents that risk. Let's take the example of China. Um, you've had a couple of very good schools with strong sponsors um, developing business schools in China. And they are today, two or three of them, very competitive on a worldwide basis, you know, mm. competing with, you know, top 20 schools in the U S top 20 schools in Europe. And, and those schools like seeds are, are absolutely competing at the highest level. Well, they're doing it at a much lower price point. So if you are Chinese and all of a sudden there's an in-country option, that's much less expensive where they speak your native language, um, that's a, that's very attractive. Now, to date, that's only a few schools that compete at that level. Um, but let's say that you're an American who wants to learn about business in China and you can get an MBA for twenty thousand um, dollars. You know, that's a lot less than the hundred and twenty or hundred and forty thousand you'll pay in the U.S. And if you really want to devote your career to that region of the world, then it's going to be <laughs> an affordable and um, a viable option for you. Yeah, and they could market it, you know, in such that half the world's GDP is going to be created in that part of the, that part of the world. And so, you know, if you're really kind of a multinational um, and, and thinking about sort of global business, then you have an added advantage of seeing how things are going to work out from a supply chain perspective, from a strategy perspective as well, right? No question about it. And India um, follows kind of close behind with their IIMs. Right? Yes. So there are multiple IIMs in um, Indian Institutes of Management across the country. I've been to the Bangalore campus a number of times, uh, interacted with their students and found them to be absolutely excellent and thirsty for, um, you know, exposure to the U.S. and understanding yeah, so the, the knock on Indian and uh, I don't know many Chinese management schools has always been that um, students tend to be not that creative. Uh, and so we almost had a monopoly uh, in graduate education in the U.S. for a long time. Now, more tactically, Brooks, um, what is happening uh, with the pandemic? Now, I would I would think management education, that face-to-face -face aspect of management education is quite important. There is a networking aspect to it. And this is especially important for somebody coming from abroad. Uh, that is part of what they're paying for. And so, so how will it work in the, in the current environment? Yeah, good question. So my heart goes out to our students who've been enrolled from China who hoped that they would be coming to the United States. We have students who were uh, enrolled last December, January, February, and their complete and total expectation would be that they would be moving to the U.S. and starting classes here in the fall. 
Um, others, of course, have been accepted and, and joined us since the pandemic um, took off. But I'm very sympathetic because some of the benefits that they had hoped for are a bit on pause currently. Um, the value of their education is partly in the knowledge, but as you suggested, also in the social networks that they develop. And being face-to-face -face enables that in a way that being at a distance doesn't. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see how it, uh, how it pans out. I want to get into your research area. So this is something that you've done a lot of work in. And I want to pick up uh, one of an earlier papers um, that you have in this area, that is turnover and retention research, a glance at the past, a closer review of the present and a venture into the future. And you say in the paper, given the extensive research on the topic of voluntary employee turnover in the past decade, uh, as well as new managerial approaches to employee retention, labor market dynamism and evolution research methodology and technology, it's important that researchers evaluate the current state of the field. Uh, and then you go on to say, you know, when we, when we look at turnover and retention research, it tend to focus on data uh, retrospectively, right? It doesn't really give you a lot of guidance as to um, as to what could be done. Uh, and so, you want to talk a bit about, uh, you know, sort of the foundation of that research? You bet. And let me first apologize for that long first sentence. I should have <laughs> broken that up into two or three. Um, in terms of uh, employee retention research. There's a hundred year history there, and there has been um, exhaustive work on the relationship between attitudes like job satisfaction or organizational commitment that we know predict a certain amount of turnover, but not all turnover. Yeah. And as an example, you might have someone who is highly satisfied with their job, but um, his spouse gets a job offer in another city. They're a dual career family. And um, he chooses to follow her to the new city. So his organization probably, if he was highly satisfied, didn't anticipate him leaving, but for this external factor, the, the wife's relocation. So that's one reason or an example why the theory of job satisfaction or a theory of organizational commitment won't predict all turnover. Mm -hmm. There are, through um, our research, we've identified a number of what we call shocks to the system. Yeah. Um, a change in a person's marital status, whether that's getting married or getting divorced or possibly having a child, these types of personal events often, not always, cause people to reconsider sort of their life, where they are, the mm. progress they're making. And so interestingly, research had sort of uncovered this, um, but it became very popular with LinkedIn. And uh, analysis of LinkedIn data shows that members are much more likely to update their profile around work anniversaries Mm -hmm. and milestone birthdays. So mm -hmm. there's something about turning 40 that causes people to have some existential um, you know, thought and say, oh, am I satisfied with my career, my trajectory, where I'm headed? And so it's not just satisfaction or commitment, but also these things happening in a person's personal life that will also influence the choice to stay in an organization or leave. And that's more recent uh, theory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember, Brooks, I, I uh, uh, had a book in uh, 2009 uh, called Flexibility, Flexible Companies for the Uncertain World, uh, in which I argue that, you know, the idea that companies are hiring employees uh, will ultimately go away. It was a bit early for, <laughs> for this idea. Uh, and I argued that ultimately we will get into sort of a self-selection process, meaning an employee self-selects an employer. And so uh, essentially, you know, the, the, the idea of um, retention and turnover uh, is really an employee's uh, problem, uh, not the firm's problem. 
and and given that we are, we you know in the long run won't have companies uh, that employees uh, work in for 20 30 years and retire with a pension that idea is going and we have maybe half life of a company is 18 months let's say that you have a very dynamic system right uh, so in in such a context how would you think about turnover and retention that's a good question, and I think that you are absolutely right in, in seeing that evolution. Uh, one of the ways uh, I'll talk with companies where I consult is not in minimizing turnover, but extending average tenure, right? Yeah. So if you're in the fast food industry and your turnover rate is 100%, meaning you have 50 positions and you have 50 incidents of turnover every year, um, Maybe what you'd like to do is say, how long are we keeping people on average? And if it's three months, say, what can we do to extend that to six months, mm -hmm. right? And how can we systematically increase the odds that people will stay with us a little bit longer? And that might be on better selection up front. It might be more training investment during the time of their tenure, or it might be something like a retention bonus that you have pre-programmed, um, Salary, salary um, balances or $500 bonuses or something that helps to recognize that. Right. So, so, so retention bonuses like that, though, um, wouldn't you want to retain certain types of people? I mean, wouldn't, isn't there a, is, <laughs> let me ask it differently. Uh, from a company perspective, you probably have a preference for a subset of people you want to retain, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, right. So in the literature, we talk about functional turnover and dysfunctional turnover. Yeah. So when a poor performer leaves, that would be functional turnover. The organization is better off because the person left. Right. Now, the proportion of turnover that's dysfunctional is usually higher than the proportion that's functional. Um, but that's when we're looking at voluntary turnover. Organizations have control over what I would call involuntary turnover, which might be layoffs or other exit um, devices. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't it that General Electric Brooks that had famously had a you know, sort of a forced turnover of 20 percent or something like that? Yeah. So an ABC system where there was a forced ranking and the C's were forced out over time, the proportion of people had to be in the C level varied. Um, but, you know, other companies pursued similar types of policies, for example, Ford and Ford had a $400 million settlement um, with employees because they argued that it discriminated on the basis of age. And so it, you know, there was a lawsuit and it was settled, but it was a very large settlement. So, uh, companies have really backed off of that um, forced ranking concept because of the discriminatory potential. Okay, okay. And so, so, so what was the, you know, kind of the major conclusions coming out of that paper? Well, I think um, the 2008 article published in the Academy of Management Annals was meant to be a summary of what we knew to date and then looking towards the future. And I think that there are a couple of important questions that we have continued to wrestle with since this article, which was published, which is really um, first around social networks, right? Mm -hmm. So um, our technology for assessing networks has gotten much better, but we're so connected online that social networks have changed in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, our ability to keep in contact with friends from undergrad or high school or early in our careers has been much enhanced. Um, what researchers will call weak ties, meaning people that you maybe you're in contact once a year or once every couple of years who now today are reachable. If a student comes to me and says, professor, I'd really like to talk to someone at Bain Capital. I say, okay, well go in and x-ray my LinkedIn mm -hmm. tell me, who you want to speak to and I'll broker an invitation for you, right? Yeah. That, that was a lot harder um, even a decade ago. Right, and, right. And so social networks become super important in terms of employee mobility 
And if they're important for employee mobility, then they become very important for turnover researchers. Yeah, so this is so, so interesting. So when I was in a pharmaceutical company in the 90s, you know, we used to map internal social networks. And the idea was that, you know, we see these big nodes uh, where uh, there are people with high influence in the organization. They may not have the big titles, but they have huge influence because a lot of people come to them for advice and things like that. And so we could identify those people. Uh, but in the last 20 years, uh, I think what has happened, uh, I think, is those types of networks got externalized right, <laughs> from a company perspective. So the network is now external to the firm. Yes, let me build on that to say yeah. that um, it's both internal and external. And I think, um, you know, your intuition from, from your experience is right. Those internal networks continue to be important. Mm. It's um, more that the external network is more um, active and accessible than ever before. And so it gains in relative strength. Yeah, and, and from, from a retention and turnover perspective, um, so if you think about both of those networks, Brooks, what, what actually influences that decision more? Uh, well, that's ongoing research right now. What I can tell you is a paper that we published in a top journal in 2016 looking at um, internal networks. There were a couple of factors that would predict whether or not someone would leave. And one was what we called essentially the Pied Piper effect. Hmm. We were within a technology firm and also within a consulting firm. And if a leader or manager who was highly respected left the organization, we were able to identify a significant, statistically significant number of people who followed him or her to the new employer. In some ways, that was the almost worst case scenario because the high performers would get pulled out, right? They're highly networked. And then they would bring with them, not the low performers, but they would make strategic invitations to people who are high performers. And that, um, that poses a significant risk to the, you know, the original organization. Mm -hmm. So it's a network uh, that turns over in, in some sense. So that has a lot of implications for intervention strategies for the firm, right? So first, if, if you're the head of HR or worried about people, you need to know who those key influencers are, those trusted nodes in the network, the people to whom people go for advice. And I think you have an extra interest in making sure um, that you are helping them to develop their careers. You're helping them to um, find you know, joy and challenge in their work and and support and enable them because retaining them increases the odds of retaining others. Yeah, yeah. And that uh, that flows nicely into your recent work, um, the article in HBR uh, entitled Better Ways to Predict Who is Going to Quit. And you say companies know that employee turnover is expensive and disruptive. And they know that retaining their best and brightest employees helps them not only save money, but also preserve competitive advantages and protect intellectual capital. You, you talked about this, you know, in some sense, turnover becomes a symptom of some sort of a process fault, right? But selection, training, uh, you know, those types of things, right? So, uh, you know, turnover is really a symptom of something not working. Uh <laughs> that that's a bit of a loaded statement in the <laughs> sense of um, I don't think that the optimal amount of turnover in any organization is zero. Right. Meaning we know from research that many good ideas come into organizations because of newcomers who come in and often if you had zero turnover, then you probably wouldn't have the need or ability to bring in that outside talent that brings with it new ideas and innovation. Right. Um, so so I, I think I would want to make sure to establish that the optimal amount is not zero. Yeah. Now, if, if you're running a big consulting firm, you know, like let's say Accenture with 400,000 employees, 
the difference between 15% turnover a year and 16% turnover is millions of dollars, tens of millions yeah. uh, of dollars. And so they have a very keen interest in keeping their rate lower than their competitors because that will incur cost savings. But you're never going to have enough compensation or enough um, job growth within an organization to um, keep everyone. Right, yeah, so I should have said, uh, it's really the difference between the target turnover and what you're actually experiencing. So that was the idea, the ABC, generic yep. like ABC yep. process, right? Yeah, well, well said. And so you're gonna have in any organization a certain uh, amount of turnover. And what you'd like to ideally do is manage to sort of the optimal number. And organizations don't have a, a precise number, but in the consulting industry, somewhere between 10 and 15% is probably close to optimal um, because it's never going to be zero for the reasons previously mentioned. Yeah, so that's an interesting sort of empirical research question, right? You said optimum turnover for a firm, uh, you know, in any industry. And can it determine that ex ante, you know, uh, given its history? Is it possible? Mm, I don't... It's something that is probably constantly evolving with yeah. things like um, customer retention, um, profit margins, right? So... If you take the consulting industry and you look back into the 90s and early 2000s with the tremendous growth of the Indian IT companies, Infosys, uh, Wipro, TCS, yeah. those um, organizations were growing so quickly um, that they were absolutely desperately concerned about turnover because they had so much work coming in, but then the American and European countries started going to India also to compete for talent. And that, that concern was doubled, right? Because if Infosys trains a um, new consultant and IBM, and let's say, I mean, Gil, I was in Bangalore, yeah. walked out the front door, front gate of Infosys, and IBM had put up a billboard that says, bring your Infosys pay stub and we'll give you 20% more, <laughs> right? Right. That, yeah. that, that's, that's competition. And, and so the it's American all, It's also the base based inflation. Oh, well, and, and right. So it, it escalates the salaries in India and yeah. puts competitive pressure on everyone. But that's, um, you know, a, globalization has enabled us to work around the clock around the globe and source the best talent at the lowest possible price. Right, right. Yeah, so, you know, um, I don't know what the status quo is, bro. Uh, human resources, you know, you, human resource department used to be sort of an oxymoron. Uh, they don't really manage any resources. It's more about compliance and uh, you know, those types of things. And so, so so one of the things you say in the paper is that most retention efforts rely on two retrospective tools. Uh, one is exit interviews that that everybody does. And the and other is the annual employee surveys. Uh, both of these tools are fairly archaic. Like it doesn't really give you much information. <laughs> it's worse than that. They're both... <laughs> looking out the rear view mirror, right? So when I'm driving my car, I spend the vast majority of my time looking through the windshield, looking forward and a limited amount of time looking back. But, but the annual employee survey, if people take it in December, the results come out in March and management has to decide what to do. And by April, when they've got some action plans, it's too late. The, the, the market's just too dynamic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, on that front, I've worked with a number of companies, including one called Tiny Pulse, that does micro surveys. And they send a pulse to a person's phone every Friday. Mm -hmm. You can ask your employees one question every week and keep your pulse of your employees, right? Yes. So that's how technology is evolving. And you'll see, you know, concerns arise in real time when you can deal with them. 
you certainly can't wait, you know, to the end of the year annual employee survey. Right, right. Yeah, and you know, uh, you talk about shocks. We already mentioned the other concept that appears to be quite important is the lo- the job embedment embeddedness, right? That's what you call it. Right. And I remember uh, Brooks again in a in a large pharma company. One of the things we used to do uh, is when when the company hires a scientist, and let's say it's a, it's a she. Uh, the company will actually extend an offer to uh, the spouse of that scientist too. Um, you know, if, if that individual is qualified for whatever program, you know, whatever educational uh, qualifications that in- individual might have, uh, he then has sort of an automatic offer that comes with the uh, with with his spouse's offer. And I think it was an attempt to get the new hire more embedded into the organization, right? Uh, great example. It's no question. What, what research has demonstrated is that people are embedded not only in the work system, but also in a community system around that with, you know, spouses, significant others, uh, children, um, but also, you know, children in schools and families in churches and sports and other activities. And when uh, a spouse, let's say, um, chooses to leave, it may also affect the rest of the family in the sense that maybe daycare is no longer provided at the new employer and it disrupts the family system. So the more sort of connections or links that you have in this web that we live in, the more likely someone is embedded and therefore likely to stay in the organization. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, again, in the paper, you you have a large data set of 500,000 individuals working in various organizations, and you develop uh, an index. You call it Turnover Propensity Index, TPI. Uh, and then you tested that uh, to to emerging on, on emerging data, right, to prove that it's actually working. Yeah. So if you don't mind a little bit of a technical explanation, this yep. was this was the fun part, right? So I'm an expert on employee retention, and I could articulate 30 different factors or indicators that would be leading indicators of whether someone would stay or leave. And I worked and want to give credit to my colleague, David Allen, who's at uh, Texas Christian University, a fabulous scholar, and to the organization we worked with, um, Engage Talent, now a part of Workforce Logic. These, um, this collaboration with Christy Whitehead there and David really was about us whiteboarding the theory of turnover, right? So this grand theory, what are all of the predictors? And then Christy using her technology abilities in a supervised learning context now with this machine learning to look at 500,000 people. And where did the data come from? It came from you and your listeners who opted into, you know, whatever app or platform and gave away your data. We, (laughs) We frankly bought the data and using that data and those 30 factors found the most probable paths for staying and quitting. And we were able then to classify people into four categories, Mm -hmm. unlikely to turn over, possibly likely to turn over, um, and and then ultimately most likely to turn over. And so we then took and tested that with a real job with 2,200 new um, people and we had a job that was in the um, tech industry and we sent the email to 2200 people who were qualified for this job and what we found is that the people who we had categorized as most likely to be interested in uh, leaving opened the email and then clicked through at a much higher rate, 10 times higher rate than people we classified as unlikely to be interested. And so then the implication becomes, wow, this could be used for recruiting agencies that are 
sourcing talent, instead of sending out blast emails that sort of fall on deaf ears, they can be much more targeted. And so it's a higher sort of target rich environment. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, the trick there would be also the data is dynamic. And so, uh, you know, in some sense, you need learning models on top of, you know, sort of a one time, one time uh, supervised algorithm, I would imagine, right? Um, that, that's right, right. So yeah. the, the 30 factors um, probably don't change much from month to month, but the weighting of those factors could very easily change. So one of the factors is the local unemployment rate, right? Yeah. Yeah. And given the pandemic, we know that there's high levels of unemployment, but it's not even across the U.S. It's higher in some areas and lower in others. And so, you know, those factors, you're absolutely right, are likely to be dynamic. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if this is appropriate, Brooks, you tell me. Uh, so if a firm is in a position that they are forced to reduce employees, uh, do you think they can go to a TPI index and, and, and really look at who is more likely to want to go and perhaps have a, have a more favorable exit contract? Hmm, that's a good question. So if I were an organizational leader um, and I were asked by the CEO to enact a 10% payroll cut, and one of the factors I would consider is something we talked about early in the podcast, which is performance. Right? Yes. So I want to do all I can to retain my high performers. It might be a strategic opportunity to let some poor performers go. But another consideration that I absolutely would consider is who is likely to leave me in the next six to 12 months anyway. Right. And so can I facilitate that with a severance package and some training or outsource, uh, um, you know, sort of career support? What what is it that I could do to make that um, easier for them? Right. Right. Yeah. There seems like some utility there. So in conclusion, Brooks, you know, if you look forward five years, um, where do you think, you know, these types of ideas uh, be? Uh, my, my feeling is that firms are going to get smaller. <laughs> Maybe that was my feeling before. We right, we're not, right now we have companies that's worth $2 trillion. So maybe I have to change my feeling. Um, there's half a dozen companies in the $2 trillion range. The rest of them are going to get smaller, let's say. Um, so in a, in a small to mid-sized company construct, uh, where do you think these types of technologies will fit in? Yeah, that's, that's a super question. Let me first invoke the great philosopher Yogi Berra, <laughs> who right. uh, w- once said, it's hard making predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So uh, I hesitate to make too many predictions, but... Five years out, I think this um, technology that allows us to develop predictive models will be much more widespread. So I've worked in the Washington, D.C. region with a number of government contractors, let's call them, um, you know, defense contractors. They're sophisticated. They've got very good uh, analytics uh, capabilities, and they're developing these models now. But I think five years from now, um, uh, 500 person firm has access to these same types of models and has used it to look at um, its retention rates or turnover propensity or however you want to characterize it. I think that that analytic capabilities become more accessible um, very quickly. Yeah, you know, it could get integrated into the management process. So, you know, if we take a full circle back to where we started, these types of things also need to get into education, right? So if you have, you know, sort of specialty management degree in HR, it, it, it really need to incorporate these types of ideas now. Oh, absolutely. That's absolutely where we are. And, and we aspire to do that even better. Uh, at Georgetown, we have a number of what we call uh, intensive learning experiences, and they tend to be like a one week long course. And one of the most successful recently was really looking at artificial intelligence in HR. And we had uh, a fabulous lineup of guest speakers and also um, 
uh, research experts who are look, looking at this intersection. You see companies like HireVue and CrossCheck that are you know, using software and science to improve uh, our ability to, to hire better. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating area. Um, so, so this has been great, Brooks. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Oh, it's and, absolutely uh, my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, and good luck with all your research. Thank you.